morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for Sands for having me. Very happy to be here with you today. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of things that have been uh, pretty influential to me, but also pretty near and dear to my heart. Uh, one of them is movies, and the other one security. And I want to talk about kind of talk about a few specific movies and some trends in the industry, and see if we can use that to kind of position us, place ourselves where we're at right now as a security field, and maybe where we can go from there. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a child of the 80s, and I remember when the first uh, movie rental store opened up in my town. And I grew up in a small town in upstate New York, and it was right across the street from my middle school. And I remember go going in and wandering the aisles and kind of picking up the boxes and seeing what the movies were about. And maybe every couple of weeks or maybe once a month, we'd rent a few of these, maybe two or three. We'd make it kind of like a movie weekend with the family, make popcorn and things like that. And it was just, it was very fond memories for me in my childhood. Um, but you know, you don't really see a lot of movie rental stores anymore, do you? This one, this one's not my childhood movie store because I couldn't find a picture of that, but this is the place I used to go to when I lived in uh, Eugene, Oregon, Flicks and Picks. But this place is also closed. Um, and I, I think this particular industry is interesting to me because I don't really think I'm that old, but it's, it's something that was born and died off in my lifetime. Uh, but does anybody, are people still watching movies? I think so. I mean, I know I do. Uh, it's just we're doing it in a different way, right? Um, so here's a, a stat we had at Netflix from earlier this year where we had one day in January where people watched 350 million hours of video. So this wasn't just movies, it was documentaries and you know, TV shows. But it shows that we still like content, we still love to watch things, but we're just doing it in a fundamentally different way. We're doing it primarily through streaming. And if we put our you know, 2018 glasses on, it seems pretty obvious, right? Why wouldn't you? If you could be sitting in your living room and just click play and have something come on the screen, why would you choose to you know, leave the house and you know, get dressed, or well, hopefully you get dressed before you leave the house, and then you know, make your way to the store, pick something out, bring it back, play it, and return it. It just seems, you know, it just seems kind of an archaic way to consume content. Uh, but you know, it, it's not like this change happened overnight. It actually played out over a few years, over several decades. And I want to talk about some of these trends that influence this rise of streaming video and the decline of movie rental. And I want to think about it through the lens of what we, what we call secular trends. And a secular trend is, is a directional, it's a long-term non-seasonal trend. So a good example is the rise of the automobile. So when cars were invented, right, it just went one direction, right? There's just more penetration of cars. And the important thing to think about with secular trends is the influence they have on related fields. So think about what happened with the horse and buggy industry when the car came out. So the first trend is if you want to do streaming video over the internet, you need the internet, right? That needs to be there. And what we're talking about here is more ubiquitous, lower cost broadband, right? You need to be able to have some reliable internet, especially at your home if you're going to consume content at home. And certainly if you look at the last few decades, we've seen the internet become pretty, pretty standard, at least in, de in the developing world. Uh, next, if you want to watch something on the internet, if you want to rent something or subscribe, you need to have a way to pay for it, right? So e-commerce, think about what's happened with e-commerce over the last couple of decades. There's lots of ways to pay for things online. Uh, then mobile, mobile is an interesting one because we're all, probably many of us, we're carrying around a pretty powerful computer that can do many things. One of them is play video, and you see more and more of this kind of consumption pattern where people are not just watching content in their living room, but on their devices, wherever they happen to be. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about was this kind, of, this kind of this idea of a subscription economy or this idea of access versus ownership. So if I can get access to something, I don't feel the need to own it. And for me, uh, the one I most identify with is music. So I, I, I moved houses earlier this year, and part of that moving, I had about 1,000 CDs that I packed up and got rid of. And I primarily use Spotify. If, I, if, there's, if, I, if there's a song I want to listen to, Chances are it's on Spotify. I feel no need to physically own that. And there's a kind of general shift, even if you think about like ebooks versus uh, paper books. People are generally more comfortable with, with kind of a virtual good. So you combine these things together and you see, well, this is why streaming video is popular. These are reasons why um, you know, movie rental has become less of a thing, at least physical movie rental. And uh, so you're thinking, you know, I appreciate that. That's, that's good information on a Monday morning, but this is a security summit. So what does this have to do with security? And I know there are some smart folks in the room, so you're probably already making some connections. And uh, 
I want to kind of position ourselves first with, um, talk a little bit about what the security industry was like when I got into the field. I, I think I got my first full-time security job in, in 1999. And if you remember 1999-ish um, to 2000, if you remember what that was like for Microsoft, that wasn't a great time. So if you remember things like Code Red and Nimda, Microsoft had a lot of, of vulnerabilities, like a lot of worms, and so it was pretty nasty. And around this time, uh, I was consulting for Microsoft. I consulted for them for about two and a half years. And um, if you recall, there was a, a memo written in 2002 that's known as the Trustworthy Computing Memo. So Bill Gates wrote this when he was leading Microsoft. And what he said in this memo was the top priority for Microsoft was security. And this was a really, really fundamental change. And the intent was to really change the direction. So to get past this idea of constant vulnerability. And being in the security field at the time was really exciting because there was all this content coming out. So I, I call this the SDL era. And the SDL refers to the security development life cycle. It's a pretty seminal book but it was also refers to this general process of how we think about securing software. And we, we really viewed it as somewhat uh, like a light at the end of a tunnel, right? Where we were gonna have this guidance and this body of knowledge that would let us know how to build security, or software more securely. And we'd get past this era of vulnerability, right? And remember, this is 2002. And has that happened? Do we, do we have, does anybody still deal with things like vulnerabilities or? So obviously the world has changed a little bit. I mean, this is by no means trying to take a dig at the content because it was really, really powerful work when you think about what they did with threat modeling um, and the overall approach to working with developers. But it's, it's similar to the movie rental industry, right? Where we still like content, we still like great movies, we're just gonna consume it in a different way. With security, the principles, the foundations don't really change, right? Think about least privilege and compartmentalization. These are still things that we work with. We're just doing it in a different way. So I want to step through some of the related secular trends that we're dealing with now and what, what's kind of leading us to where we're at. Uh, and the first one is really the amount of software. The amount of software that's out there is just ballooned. Uh, so think about, any, I don't know if anybody has a Tesla. You, you ever seen how much software runs in a Tesla? It's, it's amazing. We didn't have that 15, 20 years ago. Uh, the one that I really, I think is interesting is uh, like IoT and connected home, right? So I'm, I'm not really a big connected home person, but I have, like a Fitbit scale, and I have a, you know, a Roomba vacuum and a Nest thermostat, and all that stuff runs software, right? And that software could have vulnerabilities. And uh, there are, I mean, there's some people who are much more into it. I, I see Ben Hagen, he's gonna speak tomorrow. So Ben actually has a class B network in his home just dedicated to IoT and connected home. You don't wanna pay his electricity bill. But there's, that's all has code, that all has software, that all has vulnerabilities that we need to worry about. And then think about mobile, right? We talked about mobile and, and how people are consuming there. But if you think about all of the applications, all the apps that you run, all the app stores all around the world, that's all software. How many lines of code is that? And how, much, how many potential security vulnerabilities are there? So it's just a fundamentally different landscape in terms of volume. And then of course the delivery mechanism has changed. So right now we're primarily delivering software over the internet, right? So you think about your mobile apps, all your websites, and this is different. So when I was consulting at Microsoft, uh, we were doing assessments on products like SQL Server and Exchange Server. And back then, you actually put software on these things called CDs. And then you would get the CD as a customer and you would put it into a physical machine and actually install it Can you, in a data center that you probably owned or it was in your building. And that just seems pretty archaic when we think about how we're developing software today. But what happened was when businesses moved to online delivery of their applications and development teams moved that way, they started to realize that you could change your software however you felt like it, whatever frequency you wanted to. You didn't have to wait for six month development life cycles. You could do it immediately. And that of course led to a lot of innovation in how we develop software. So things like DevOps or Agile, continuous deployment, all these things are designed to figure out how to develop, how to deliver software more quickly. Related to that is the underlying technology, things like cloud and containers and think about the um, really, w what kind of change this has had on, on the development and operations environment. Uh, and then last but not least is open source. Um, because right now, this, this again, it speeds velocity because as a developer, I have to work on a relatively small amount of business logic, but then I can pull in things like open source operating systems and databases and JavaScript frameworks to really make it quite simple and quick to deliver software. 
So that kind of adds up where, where I, if I think about like before and after, kind of the SDL era of security and kind of how we were delivering, I, I like to use this analogy where I think of a, an hourglass, right? So think of the individual grains of sand as, as software, right? So at that earlier era, right, it was a relatively small amount of delivery. It tended to go through a, a single channel. And then I, I fast forward to today and I think of more like this idea of the industrial sand pit. Right, where you've got lots of distributed moving of software, lots of software being created. You've got really heavy machinery, so really, really high volume. So then what we need to do is figure out as a security field, well, how do we deal with this amount of change, this amount of velocity, and this amount of volume of uh, software? Well, of course, the security industry and the security professionals are not growing at a similar rate. Um, and that kind of leads to this, this slide here, and this is actually not new. So I, I borrowed this from Matt Tassaro. I've been using this in, in, in DEX. I think he first used this in like 2012. So this is not a new, and, and I think folks who are actually at, at summits like this, you've seen the, the writing on the wall, right? You realize that the way we have been practicing software security does not actually adapt particularly well to what we need to do now. So then it's kind of up to us, right? We've got to figure out where do we go from here. And that's kind of like the first sort of lesson learned. Um, this is a, a I, I like to use this comparison. Um, if you think about the difference between kind of tactics and strategy or vision and execution, uh, if you ever rowed or if you have a, like a single rower trying to make their way across a lake, uh, when you're rowing, your back is actually faced to the direction you're going. So you have to be rowing to move it, but you also have to keep an eye on where you're going. So for me, I like to think we need as a, as a field, we need to keep an eye on what these trends are and make sure that we're moving along with those, um, those trends versus against them. So I want to get back to the movies here and kind of talk about a few more specific items. And I'm going to try to blend in some, some practical examples of things that we've done at Netflix, as well as some high-level learnings. And I won't go into a super amount of detail, but I know when I, when I go to see talks, I like to hear kind of what people are actually doing in the field. So it's, it's nice to hear about ideas, but I like to see them sort of backed up. So I'll try to put those both together. Uh, and the first movie I want to talk about, uh, maybe you're familiar with this one, uh, Dazed and Confused. I think this was maybe in the 90s, maybe 2000s. Also a really popular Led Zeppelin song for any hard rock fans. Uh, but we're not going to talk about like high school hijinks or you know smoking marijuana, but which is basically what the movie's about. But when I want to talk about Dazed and Confused, I want to talk about what does a developer feel like on day one when they start a new job, right? How do they think about, well, how do I get code like, from out of my brain? How do I get an idea out of my brain into production? And we might think it's pretty simple, right? So you hire a developer for whatever they're working on. Maybe it's a, it's a data pipeline, or it's a UI, or it's a mobile app. But they have to actually think about a bunch of things to actually be effective. They have to understand the basics around how do you actually deploy code? What are the standards? How do you do ops? There's the non-functional requirements like reliability and observability. And environments change, so you have to think about how do you do upgrades, how do you do migrations, how do you do other campaigns, and of course there's security, right? So what you've, what you've done is you've hired somebody for this gray box, but what you're requiring them to do is internalize all the other stuff, right, to get their job done. And that's what I want to talk about first is this idea of uh, reducing cognitive load for developers. So I'm not an educator, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not an expert on this, but you kind of think about cognitive load as the, the collection of things you need to learn to get something done, right? How do you learn something? So we know that there are easier ways to learn things or harder ways, and a lot of it depends on, on us as individuals. The example I like to use here is pretend for a second you didn't know what a square was, right, this shape. You didn't know what that was, and I was going to try to teach you what that was. I could do that in a, in a variety of ways. I could show you this, this picture, and say this is a square. Um, or I could ask you to read this definition, right? So chances are, when you look at either one of those, you'll know what a square is. But one of them was probably a little bit easier to understand. And that's what I think we as a security field need to do, right? We need to think about how can we simplify the interface between engineers, between developers, and security teams. And there's a couple of, of questions I like to think about here is, you know, are you trying to make your engineers security experts? Yes, no? Or do you just want them to build and operate secure systems? Because these are different things. So me, I care about the outcome. I want my developers to build and operate secure systems. Right? So then it's my job as a security leader to figure out what are the investments I want to make to have that happen. 
And really what I want to focus on is what are the functions that we can abstract from developers so they can simplify their experience? Because they got a lot of stuff they got to keep in their head. I want to have them worry about security as little as possible. And I want to talk about this through an example of uh, what we call studio engineering. So Netflix actually started as a DVD by mail company back in, I think, about 20 years ago. Transitioned to a streaming video provider where we were taking content from other studios and putting it on the service. And in the last five or six years, we've actually transitioned to creating a lot of our own content. So things that you may be familiar with, like BoJack Horseman, which is my favorite Netflix original, or uh, Stranger Things, which has uh, become pretty popular. So we actually create this content. We, we're doing this as part of what we would call the Netflix studio. And uh, this, so if, you, if you're familiar at all with, with the, cr the creation process of content, so things like movies and TV shows, it hasn't really changed a lot in the last 50 or 75 years. It's very physical, very manual. And what Netflix is trying to do is we're trying to produce a lot of content. So not just like Hollywood US content, but we're creating originals in India and Brazil and Spain and Denmark, right? Because we, we want to do a lot of content. And one of our real big bets is uh, studio engineering. And studio engineering is really designed to optimize the production process of content from what we call pitch to play. So pitch is when somebody gives us an idea. Play is when it's actually on the service available for our members. And there's a lot of steps that goes that happen in between those two things. And so there's a lot of innovation and iteration in this team because they're trying to solve a problem that hasn't really been solved with technology before. So you got you know, hundreds of engineers working on this, dozens of different apps. That's kind of in like lots and lots of change. So our studio apps work you know, pretty much like, uh, like a standard line of business app. You have studio users, and these are people like accountants, they're marketing people, and they're accessing this variety, sort of dozens of different line of business apps to do things like budgeting or scheduling, when, when should the cast be on set, those kinds of things. So what we wanted to do, because we knew there was a lot of iteration, there was a lot of functionality we're trying to create, we want to simplify security. And we wanted to do it leveraging some open source that we had. We've actually open sourced this, I think, five years ago. Uh, it's called Zool. And Zool is a routing gateway. So if you've ever used the Netflix service, your traffic goes through an instance of Zool. Um, it handles inbound traffic. It manages the traffic to the back end and then returns it to you as a user. And our thought was we could leverage this for, to actually simplify security for our studio engineering team. And what we do with, with Zool is we insert it in between the user and the app. And the way Zool works is it has this idea of pre-filters and post-filters. So pre is what happens as traffic's coming in, post as it's going out. So what we do here is we create different, function, different components of security functionality, rate limiting, IP blacklisting, auth, um, even a, a web app firewall that we can integrate with Zool. And then post-filters, you can do things like adding security headers. You can do DLP. But the primary thing, in addition to the functionality, is you've externalized it from the developers, right? So you're letting them worry about studio engineering and letting us worry about security. And that's kind of like the second lesson. It's like, let, how can we simplify things? Or how do we simplify things for developers and for us as security teams? Because we know they have a lot on their minds and we want to let them focus on moving the business forward. This is the next movie I want to talk about. Anybody recognize this one? Uh, Inception. So I, I've seen Inception uh, several times. I couldn't actually tell you what it's about. It's, it's pretty confusing. Um, the general gist, and hopefully I have this somewhat correct, is that there's kind of different levels of consciousness and sort of state of being. So there's us here, right? We're awake. Hopefully we're awake. But you could be sleeping. You could have a dream. You could have a dream within a dream. And there's this whole idea that you could insert something into one layer and kind of have it propagate out. Um, so it's, it's a pretty neat movie, but it's kind of a mind bender. And um, so when, how I apply this to security or tech is I really think that there's a lot of, of these sort of blurred lines now, especially between applications and infrastructure. So some examples. Uh, so think about the monolith to microservices migration. When you go this route, when you're running a monolith, all your code's running on a single system. Right? The network is not part of that application. When you move to microservices, the network is an integral part of the application. That's a pretty big change. Uh, and then immutable infrastructure. You're taking an operating system, your custom application, middleware, and you're putting it all into one deployment artifact and managing that as a, as a standalone item. And then think about just generally infrastructure as code, software-defined networking. Um, 
one thing I, th I, I think is really interesting in this space are deployment mechanisms like Terraform or CloudFormation where with a single sort of deployment execution, you're really sending out there an entire stack. And that stack could be a network, it could be load balancers, it could be DNS entries, it could be an auto-scaling cluster, back-end database. And what this means for us as security teams is that we need to think about how do we deal with this, this, this lack of clear separation. Because if you rewind in the security industry maybe 15 years ago, it was a bit simpler to think about. Because we had the network security team, right? And they were dealing with firewalls and VPNs and IDS. You had the AppSec team and they were dealing with code reviews and threat models. But now we've got like who does what, right? When you think about infrastructure as code. And so this can be a little bit unsettling because anytime things change, it's always a little bit risky. But I would say this is actually a really nice opportunity to think about how we can gain efficiency. And I want to talk through an example of getting efficiency through a process of, of getting least privilege in infrastructure as a service. So what I call the magic of infrastructure as a service is um, I, just a, a little bit of explanation. So I think it's neat to take an app and kind of launch a cloud instance, and that's, that's cool. But you really start to unlock the power of infrastructure as a service when you get your application talking to the other infrastructure services that your provider gives you. So this is an example from Amazon Web Services. That's uh, Netflix's primary cloud provider. Um, so an example here is email services. Right? So say you have an app, it's a customer-facing app, and you have a need to email your customer. Before infrastructure as a service, you had to actually run all of that infrastructure. You had to have a mail relay, you had to handle deliverability issues, but that wasn't actually what your application was doing. You just needed to do that as a communication means. With AWS, with email services they provide, you make an API call and your message is sent. Really, really simplifies things, it improves reliability, and it allows the developer to think about their core functionality. The problem is, security-wise, is that for your app to take advantage of those services, it needs to have credentials. It needs to have credentials associated with interacting there. And the model that we've had previously, again, going back 15 or so years with the old kind of three-tiered application model, you did have that idea of embedded credentials, but it was typically to interface with a database. So a database connection string that allowed you to read or write from a database. The credentials here on these instances allow you to interact with the entire cloud environment. So not only read and write, but you could do some pretty destructive actions. So this is important for security teams to understand. It gives you a lot of functionality, a lot of capability, but there's also some risk there. So I want to talk about how we can kind of work through this problem. And I want to uh, dive in a little bit to an example. Um, but first, before that, so IAM is what AWS uses to provide this kind of authorization, this kind of access policy. It's not really a tutorial, but it's a pretty straightforward authorization mechanism. You have an application that uses a role that role has some policies, those policies have permissions, and the sum of that basically tells you what your application is allowed to do. So let's pretend we're that developer and it's day one, we've just started a new job, and your manager tells you, hey, I want you to build a cloud-based word processor for some reason, because that sounds like a good idea. And you're, you're excited about it, and your manager says, and we also, we use AWS, so go ahead and use AWS to take advantage of all the infrastructure services and really make your job easier. So you're pretty excited as a developer because you know it's going to save you a bunch of time. So then you, you get your permissions to start doing your work. And you don't really need to know IAM or AWS. You can probably smell that there's some problems there. Usually when you see stars in access control policies, there's something not quite right. And we're going to tell this story through emojis. So this emoji is the front page of the newspaper because this might be where you end up if you use this kind of policy because what you're doing here is you're saying you can do anything you want in AWS destroy, create, whatever you want to do. So you as a developer, as a responsible developer, you're saying, well, you know, I only need, I, based on my architecture, I only need to store some files. So in AWS, that's done with a service called S3. So then we take a turn on that, and we say, okay, well, let's only give you access to S3. So the emoji gets a little bit better, but we're still screaming because we still have some, some stars in there. What this policy allows you to do is anything in S3, right? So you can, you can configure, you can manage, the developer says, you know, actually, I only need a little bit of functionality. I only need a couple of API calls. So then, you know, we're getting better. We're getting warm here. We only need to get some objects and put some objects. Still have one remaining problem, that remaining star, because you can do this across the entire storage infrastructure. So we say, well, let's only allow us to do that with just the storage I need. 
And that's where we get to this final, where you now have what you would call a least privileged access control policy. You have only the permissions to do what you need to do on the resources that you need. So I know what you're saying. It's like, well, that's kind of a no-brainer. Let's just do that. Let's just do that for all our applications. Well, there is, there is a lot of problems. If anybody has ever tried to do least privilege in practice, it is not that simple. And I can't talk about least privilege without talking about Goldilocks and the three bears, my favorite analogy for this. Um, so I won't recount the whole um, fairy tale, uh, but Goldilocks is wandering in the woods and goes into the three bears' cabin. She's hungry. There's some porridge on the table. She tries one, it's too hot. Tries the next one, it's too cold. Tries the middle one, yeah, it's perfect. And then, of course, she just had breakfast. She wants to take a nap. Goes in the beds. One's too hard, one's too soft. The third one's just right. So ultimately, Goldilocks gets what she wants, right? That she gets like their least privilege or exactly what she's looking for. But there's a lot of collateral damage, right? Put yourself in the bear shoes. You just had your breakfast eaten, your bed slept in. And this is very similar to least privilege in practice. Because if, if what we are, our instinct as security professionals is to say, well, let's just start with nothing and then go from there. Like, tell me what you need. The problem is that doesn't work. Because developers, when they're starting out, they don't actually know what they need. So if you go on this, this practice of, well, let's, you know, we'll give you this, and then you, the problem there is then the developer starts to iterate. They run into a problem. They troubleshoot it. They find out they need one more permission. They come and ask you. You do that 15 times, and you get to least privilege. The problem is there you've, you've killed the velocity, and you've also probably created some relationship problems with the developer. And now the next time the developer needs that, they're just going to reuse that permission because they just don't want to deal with it anymore. Right? So you've really, you've caused some issues there. So the nice thing about AWS is that it actually tells you how you're using the API. There's a couple of services, CloudTrail and Access Advisor, that can give you a sense of how you're using the environment, how you're interacting with it. And then what we can do as security teams is use that to our advantage. So what we do at Netflix is we've, over many years of observation, many hundreds of applications, we've observed how our developers and applications interface with AWS. And we use that to create a, a, a set of what we would call base permissions. And then when you create a new application, if you're that new developer on day one and you're creating the cloud-based word processor, we give you the base set of permissions. It is overly permissive, right? But for us, it's a good balance, right? If you think about one extreme is you have no rights, the other extreme is you have all rights. For this, this is, for us, this strikes a good balance between functionality, velocity, and security. And then what we do, once you have that base set of permissions, we just keep an eye on what's happening because we have those audit logs. We know what you're actually doing. And what we, the important thing here is it's not about what do you ask for or what do you think you need, it's what does the application actually do. We know positively what it does. And then what we do is we just remove unused permissions, right? We give you a set. If you're not using all those, we're just going to remove those. And the nice thing is developers don't even need to know what IAM is, right? They just use things, and things will generally work, and the permissions will get, will get reaped, you know, when they're not, not, not being used. We've actually open sourced that um, as RepoKit, if you're interested in that um, approach. And the... Analogy I like to use for this is this is a, a, a kind of a kind of a graphical rendition of the hyperloop. Yeah, so I, I think of this as transparent, high speed, and frictionless. And I think transparency is, is an important thing for security teams to embrace. If you're making decisions about what developers can do, you want to make that information available. You want to make that decision transparent. In this case, we have all the data. We're making decisions based on it. The developers know exactly what we're doing and why we're doing it. And it's also high speed. Like it just, it's always running in the background. This is not like a transactional thing that you as a developer needs to engage with. We're just handling it in the background. So it also gets back to that idea of lowering cognitive load. Developers don't need to worry about how they access AWS. And the last movie I want to talk about is uh, The Purge. So I think at this point, there's maybe three or four of these movies. And it's a little bit of a grim view on society if anybody's watched one of these. But the purge is basically one day a year, the laws are just like thrown out the book, out the window. And you can do whatever you want. Kill people, steal. Uh, it's basically anarchy. And so you're probably thinking, well, what does anarchy have to do with technology and security? And I would argue that a lot of the trends that we talked about in terms of you know, microservices, it's actually leading towards the potential 
for anarchy, for controlled anarchy. I don't know why I put those quotes there, but. Um, so microservices, right? So we went from monolith to microservices. We've, we've intentionally distributed the way systems are developed. We've gotten off this idea of a central release train. Um, and with microservices, often comes this idea of you build it, you run it, right? So if you're going to be building a service, you have to run it. And what we've done here is we've decentralized operations, right? So you might have used to have a single operations team that had a, a practice and a body of knowledge and run books and playbooks. And now you're saying, well, actually all the teams need to do that. We've got polyglot, multiple tech stacks. One of the promises of microservices when you're moving to an architecture where your application, or excuse me, your API, your service layer is the boundary, the idea is that you can iterate behind that boundary all you want. You can use whatever technology, make whatever decisions you want, because it doesn't matter as long as you're maintaining that API contract. And then you have independent deployments, right? Some teams are deploying daily, hourly, weekly, bi-weekly. So there's no longer a single deployment train. And what we as security professionals need to understand is that we have intentionally decentralized governance, right? We didn't sort of wander there. We've intentionally done it as a community, as a business, because we want to unlock that velocity, right? So we've said we no longer want that hourglass approach where everything is moving through a single thing. We actually want this. This is a desirable thing. But also leads to increased attack surface. And the analogy I, I like to use to talk about this problem is uh, eating dinner, and specifically different ways of eating dinner. Uh, folks are familiar with tapas. So tapas is kind of like a Spanish cuisine. It's a style of eating. I think it technically means small plates. But the idea, if you've ever had it, is you go with usually a group, and it's a very random ordering. Like maybe I feel like one thing here, and then I'm going to have a glass of wine, then I'm going to order three more things, and then you know we're going to chat for a little bit, and then we're going to order five more things. But it's very random. It's very high touch. It's very customized. There's no like appetizer, you know, meal, dessert. It's not that kind of format. And this is how I think about security in the SDL era. It was very high touch. We had some process and structure around it, but it was very high touch and custom based on what we were, what we were working on. So an alternate to that, has ever, anybody ever had dinner at a large wedding? Like say maybe four or 500 people? Probably not even that big. It's a lot different experience, right? So you don't have a lot of choice. You don't have a lot of customization. You got your appetizer, you got sort of chicken, fish, vegetarian, that kind of thing. You don't have a lot of interaction with the server, right? There's no substitution. There's not, not a much cost, customization. It's a fundamentally different experience and there are trade-offs. But this is what, what has been designed to allow you to serve that many people all at once. And to me, this is where we need to start moving as a security industry, if you're dealing with high velocity and large volume software. Right? You have to start thinking about making trade-offs and what you're doing in a custom way versus what you're doing in a scalable way. Because custom tends not to scale. It scales with humans, right? And if, you, if anybody here can add another 100 people to their AppSec team, then I would say you could probably stick with the Tapas model. We certainly can't, so you know, we're looking more towards the, the wedding dinner. And I wanna, wanna walk through this, managing the anarchy, through a couple of programs that we run at Netflix that are uh, similar, they're related, they're different, but similar enough that I wanna talk about them together. And the first one is called Production Ready, and you may have read uh, Susan Fowler's book called Production Ready Microservices, and this shares a lot in common with that. And then the other one is called The Pave Road. So to step through these, uh, prod ready or production ready, for us, it's a SRE driven developer outreach program. Because the idea is that we've been running large scale distributed systems in the public cloud for a lot of years. We've learned a bunch of things about those. And so we want to use production ready as a means to evangelize those practices. We're not going to tell you you have to do them, but we're going to say, this is what we know. You know, use the information. We have automated scoring. That's one of the real keys, is that it's not that we're just giving you advice of like do X, we're actually seeing whether or not you do that. So an example for us is like an availability pattern, is we wanna run systems in multiple availability zones. And those are just different ways of getting higher availability. So we can actually tell whether your application is running in multiple availability zones. That's really what we're, what we're looking for. Are practices that we evangelize and recommend that we can, at, we can, in an automated way, evaluate your compliance. 
And what we're trying to do is uncover risk and reward operational excellence. As a security team, if we've identified 15 things in security production ready, I can tell how many of those you're doing. Say you're only doing three of those things, right? You're not doing, you've chosen not to do 12 of those. Now I'm gonna figure out how we can engage and drive that level up. The paved road, again, it's, it's similar, but paved road is more of a kind of outbound engagement from centralized teams. So we're a centralized team, my team, my security team. Are there other centralized teams that are doing things like persistence or performance? And this is the, these are the well-supported platforms, right? So we've already paved the road, you get on it, things will be smooth, that's the idea. It addresses a bunch of common technical issues, and it's you know, the best of what we would call technology standards, because generally what you're trying to do in microservices, polyglot, is you're trying to actually not have standards because you're decentralizing that, decentralizing that guidance, but things still need to work together. So I'm gonna talk, these are just some examples of security production ready things that we have, like make sure you're not storing secrets in your code, make sure you have an up-to-date instance, some different configuration settings in AWS, but these are all things that we can observe and let you know whether or not you are security production ready. And this is the production ready scorecard. What you see here on the left-hand side, the left-hand column, it's a little bit of an eye chart, but those are the different dimensions of production ready. So you think, see things like auto-scaling, dashboards, and what we want to do is get all of these to 100%, because this is actually a graph over time. And, and basically, as a developer, if this is your service, you're, you're running at 77% production ready. What that means is you're doing 77% of the things we think you should be doing. We're not really going to get into why you're not doing those other 23%. We would like to see more adoption, but I think, well, in this one, there are actually no 100%. But what we want to get is to 100% on all items. Once you're there, what, you're, what you've done is you're, you're basically doing everything we think you should be doing. That doesn't mean like you, you don't make any more improvements, but you're at where we want you to be. So in the paved road, uh, the example I wanted to talk through is what we call the quarterly change cycle. So patch management and change management has been something that is just an unbelievably difficult problem. It's also, for a lot of security people, it's not a real interesting problem to work on. But we all, I think everybody in this room would say it's actually it's very important to have up-to-date systems. So our bet in this area is what we call the quarterly change cycle. So you as a developer, right, we're not going to pester you with a lot of updates. What we're going to ask you to do is opt into the quarterly change cycle. So when you do this, when you're saying, I will participate, you're committing to pushing your code once a quarter. Now, most teams at Netflix do it much more often than that, daily, weekly. But there are more mature services. You have no need to do deployments. But because you want to be a good citizen, you're going to deploy once a quarter. And we have a bunch of tools that make that easy to do. But by doing that, you bring in all the right updates. Right? So I don't need to engage you with all the latest um, you know, security issues. As long as you're in, engaged in the quarterly change cycle, we know you'll pick those updates up. And we also have a centralized engineering team that manages the interface to the quarterly change cycle. So I'm gonna walk through an example of one of the things that my team does to participate. So we run a bunch of security services that developers use, and we wanna make sure they're using the right versions and the right configurations. And so the quarterly change cycle has this concept of deprecations and blacklists. So things that are outdated, things you shouldn't be doing. And then we as a team, we can basically develop against that interface to inspect what's going on in the environment. So here's an example. We run a system called Gandalf and it's an authorization system. And there's an agent, and you could probably look at that and, and see what we're trying to do. We're basically saying, if this Gandalf agent is less than this version, we want to note it as a, as a deprecation. So what the developer would do, they will know that. They don't, have, they don't need to install Gandalf separately or upgrade it separately. Just make sure you're in the quarterly change cycle, do your quarterly update, everything is working. But what we need to do as a centralized team, as a security team, is, is to be able to evaluate adherence with that. So that central infrastructure also allows you to track how well that's, how that penetration is going. So you see there, like in April, you'll see that spike up. So before that, we, we weren't running that campaign. This is called a campaign, a deprecation campaign. And all of a sudden we saw a big spike up. And then as the quarter goes through, you see fewer and fewer applications are out of compliance. And then what we do is we, we try to get that to zero, but you know, there's always some outliers, but then there's a much smaller group of people we need to engage with. 
So rather than engaging with all those teams, we just work with those, uh, those outliers. So our intention here, this is kind of getting back to that dinner analogy, we're trying to make the security backlog standard, the majority of it. And the backlog here is just the asks that we have of our engineering teams. So all the things that we ask them to do for production ready and paved road, we want to make that as common as possible across all engineering teams. Because this is a, another one of those differences between the tapas and the wedding dinner. With tapas, like your server, right, if you think about the server as, as your security team, you're only dealing with, with one app versus the wedding, right, you got all these hundreds and hundreds of engineering teams and hundreds and hundreds of apps to work with. So we want to limit how custom we get with what we're asking teams to do. We really want to focus that human energy on the higher risk applications of the more, more complex systems. So there you have it, paved road. Hopefully when you see a paved road, it's pretty clear where you should be going, right? You should be driving down that. You shouldn't be in the ditch. So that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to be really clear about our intentions and expectations. And then we also think measurement is important. Because if you're creating solutions, if you think that these are the right things to solve problems, you want to measure how well they're actually being adopted and if they're, if they're, if they're in, in fact solving the problems that you expect them to be. So just kind of wrapping things up, I'm going to just cover these overall takeaways. So the first, and, and this is probably the meta takeaway, is you, I think we really need to stay attuned to trends. I think Frank and I were joking about it this morning, but a really good example Again, let's put our 2018 glasses on and think about cloud computing, right? Does anybody like think that cloud computing is, is not a good, like there's no benefit there, right? It's, it's probably the default. If you're gonna start a business today, you're probably gonna use AWS or GCP or Azure to do your deployments, to do your development. You're probably gonna use Gmail for your mail. You're gonna use Workday or something like that. You're not gonna be installing a bunch of stuff. But I would say what I would challenge you to do is put on your 2008 glasses, right? So go rewind 10 years. At that time, many IT groups, many security teams were very, very viciously fighting against cloud, right? The problem is the business was demanding cloud, right? So what we should have been doing is actually working to get there, right? So that's what I say, you gotta keep an eye on where things are going and make sure we're helping the business get there versus fighting against it. Uh, the next one is, is simplify. Simplify, standardize. You have to find ways to make your developers' jobs easier, make your jobs easier, so you can deal with the scale and you can deal with the velocity. Uh, transparent decisions, we talked about that when we, when we looked at the AWS permissions. I'm a really, I'm a fan. You have to make sure that you're letting your, your engineers know how you're making decisions. So you have to be able to inspect that, right? And that's the way you, you actually build trust with your engineering partner. And measuring adoption is important, and then really getting comfortable with trade-offs, knowing that we can't do everything, like we're going to have to make some trade-offs. I know as security folks, we think we're, we're great at risk management, and, and, but sometimes in reality, we're, we're afraid to let things go. So I, I wanna make sure you keep that in mind. Uh, and that's a wrap. And Jason, thanks so much. Mm -hmm.